Welcome to our Bible study. We're continuing in the book of John. If you'll open your Bibles to John chapter 7, we're going to look at uh, the continuance of Jesus' teaching and his ministering in the midst of those that were opposing him. In, in chapter 7, verse 1, it begins with after this. We mentioned that last week in that in John's writing, John is not writing a day-to-day -day, uh, chronology of Jesus' life, but instead, because he is proving the divinity of God, he is pulling out some different stories at different times where Jesus affirms that he has been sent by God and that he is God. In Genesis, or excuse me, in uh, John chapter seven, verse one, it says, "After this, Jesus traveled in Galilee, since he did not want to tr to travel to Judea because the Jews were trying to kill him." So keep in mind, geography-wise, Galilee is to the north; it's uh, around the Sea of Galilee, and Judea is more to the south. That's where Jerusalem is located. The Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, so his brother said, now his brothers are his, his followers, his disciples, so his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples can see your works that you're doing. For no one else, or, or for no one does anything in secret while he's seeking public recognition. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. The Jews travel to Jerusalem several times a year for Passover, and, and this was another time when they had what's known as the, the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of, uh, or the Festival of the Booths, B-O-O-T-H-S. Now what is this? This goes back to uh, Leviticus chapter 23, where the Lord instructs uh, the Israelites to observe this festival every year. Uh, it, it, the Lord spoke to Moses in, in Leviticus 23:33, and it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, Tell the Israelites, The festival of booths to the Lord begins on the 15th day of the seventh month and continues for seven days. There is to be a sacred assembly on the first day. You're not to do any daily work. You're pre to present a fire offering to the Lord for seven days. On the eighth day, you're to hold a sacred assembly and present a fire offering to the Lord. It is a solemn gathering. You're not to do any daily work. And then he goes on and he talks more ab about this. This happened after the harvest time. And uh, the, the people would gather together and, and the instructions are given. They're to take palm branches and they're to take uh, other types of, of uh, branches from trees. And they're to, to, to make a booth, if you will, a, a tent. And they're actually to, to sleep in this for these seven days. It's a reminder for them of the time that for 40 years their ancestors uh, wandered in the wilderness in order to get to the promised land. There were some things that happened during this festival. There were large candles that were set up on the Temple Mount, and these candles were a reminder of the fire and the light that God used to guide them uh, to, to the promised land. Uh, there was a, a gold vessel that they would go to the pool of Siloam and fill with water and then they would come and they would pour that water out of that gold vessel to remind them that God provided water for them from the rock. We're told in Scripture to remember, to go back and remember the works that God has done. The reason we remember the works God has done is that helps us to interpret the present time, but also it's a guide for the future. This festival of booze or the festival of tabernacles was an annual time where Jews would travel from all around back to Jerusalem and have this sacred assembly where they'd all gather together on, the, uh, on a couple of different times during this festival. 
So his disciples said, this is a great time for you to go to Jerusalem and, and to, to publicly be seen, publicly do your works, and you're going to draw a big crowd. Jesus did just the opposite. Jesus did not do that. He, 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 the scripture says that uh, because some of the Jews were trying to kill him, he said, I'm not going to go right now. But I think there's something even more than that. Jesus did not desire public recognition. That wasn't why he was doing what he was doing. Jesus had come to seek and to save the lost. He came to make disciples, and that's one person at a time. Yes, Jesus spoke to 5,000. Yes, Jesus uh, gave the Sermon on the Mount as our pastor is preaching through Luke. Yes, Jesus gave this instruction or the Sermon on the Plain. But while Jesus spoke publicly, he spoke to them as individuals, each person. Jesus didn't come to build a, a, a big crowd in order to get public recognition, but instead to change lives. Now let's pick up with verse number 10. After his brothers had gone up to the festival, then he also went up, not openly, but secretly. Now, perhaps he went by himself, perhaps is a very small group, we don't, don't really know. But he did not go just coming into town riding on a white horse or with a big entourage around him with everybody seeing what was going on. He came in kind of uh, in a quiet, secret manner. It wasn't because he was ashamed of anything. It wasn't because he was trying to hiding, hide, but instead he, he did not want all this crowd around him for this. Now look at verse number 12, or verse number 11. It says, the Jews were looking for him at the festival and saying, where is he? And there was a large discussion about him among the crowds. Some were saying, he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he's deceiving the people. Still, nobody was talking publicly about him because they feared the Jews. Now, that sounds contradictory. It says they were talking about him. There's a lot of discussion about him. But then they were saying they weren't talking about him publicly because of the fear of the Jews. In this passage of Scripture, we, we see uh, really uh, two or three different groups of people in this. In, in this. One is we see the the, the the Jews that they're talking about here that were discussing among themselves, where is he? There were Jews, the Jews that lived in Jerusalem had heard about Jesus. They had heard about uh, his healing uh, of, of the man at the pool. They had heard about other things and the teachings he had done, but perhaps they had never seen him. They had heard about him, but they'd never seen him for themselves, and they were the ones that were asking. But the second group of people, these were the religious leaders of the day. These were the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. These were the ones that were opposing Jesus. These were the ones that were saying, why did you do this on the Sabbath day, and how could you do this, and how could you claim this? They were the ones that were opposing Jesus. So you had the, 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 the religious leaders of the day who opposed Jesus. You had those that had heard about Jesus but had not experienced him personally that were just wondering about him. But then you, thirdly, you had also a group of people that had come in to this festival of tabernacles from surrounding areas and they'd never even heard about Jesus. You know, we get our news today in a variety of sources. I get mine primarily off of my phone today. Uh, if something significant happens, uh, there'll be a little pop-up on one of the uh, news outlets that, that I, I follow, that I have apps for, and it will pop up. On occasions, I will watch the news on television. I don't do that regularly, but sometimes I will. And sometimes uh, I'll just get on my phone or get on my iPad and I'll go to a, a news app and I'll just read what's been, what's been happening. That's, that's how I get my news, what's happening in the world. And today it's a small world because of our technology that we have. In that day, though, uh, 
Let's say there are people that live down in the Negev, down in the uh, southern area uh, uh, of Israel toward Egypt, a and these people had never heard of Jesus. Jesus had done his ministry up north or some in the Jerusalem area, but he, he had not been down in their area before. Maybe some over on the Mediterranean coast. And, and so when they came to town, they began to hear other people talk about this, but they didn't know who he was. So three different groups of people. So let's, let's find them. In verse number 12, he says there was a lot of discussion about him among the crowds. This is probably the people from Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem. They said, where, where is he? We want to see him for ourselves. And some of them were saying, you know, he's a good man. He must be a good man if you heard the good things he's done. And there were others that were saying, oh, no, 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 no. He, he's, he's, not, he's not necessarily that. He's not necessarily a good man. He's just deceiving the people. And so they were having all kinds of discussion about his character. But then it said they, they hesitated talking about him publicly because of fear of the Jews. Well, that Jew that they're talking about at the end of verse 13, that's the religious leaders of the day. They're the ones that have been violently opposed to Jesus Christ. In fact, they, they, they had planned how they could go about even killing him. Verse number 14, when the festival was already half over, so middle of the week, Jesus went up into the temple complex and he began to, to teach. Then the Jews were amazed and said, how does he know the scripture since he hasn't been trained? These are probably the people that had never heard of Jesus before, or perhaps some of those that lived in Jerusalem but never experienced him for themselves and said they, they were amazed at how he taught and you know we, we've, we've studied before how people have said he has taught with such authority and Jesus responds in verse number 16 again or keep in mind John is writing this to build a case to present that Jesus is divine Jesus said my teaching isn't mine but it is from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will understand whether the teaching is from God or if I am speaking on my own. The one who speaks for himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Didn't Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you want to kill me? Jesus is making a statement here that is an incredible spiritual truth that we need to grasp. We need to understand this truth. He is saying in verse number 17, and let me just paraphrase it for you here. If anyone is willing to do God's will, then he shall know it. Here's another way uh, uh, of, of saying that. He is saying, if you want to know truth, then you've got to obey truth. Think of this. In Genesis chapter 3, where we see sin coming into the world, Satan offered Adam and Eve knowledge but it was knowledge based on disobedience. <laughs> you remember God says, you can have anything you want in this garden except this tree right here. And Satan said just the opposite. Oh, eat of that tree, then you'll have knowledge. A lot of people today want knowledge, but do it through disobedience. That will never happen. If you want spiritual truth, it will only come as you are in obedience to the Lord. Jesus offered knowledge as a result of obedience. Let me say that again. Jesus offered knowledge as a result of obedience. G. Campbell Morgan said it this way. When men are holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, when men are holy, completely consecrated to the will of God, and want to do that above everything else, then they will find out that Christ's teaching is divine, 
and that it is the teaching of God. The Lord wants our obedience. And as we are obedient to Him, it is then we discover that God's Word is absolute truth. Yes, we accept it as truth. Yes, by faith we accept it as truth. But folks, it is when we are in obedience to God's will that we are truly experiencing and truly understanding the truth of God's Word. Now Jesus closes this little part of the conversation which says, and why do you want to kill me? Now that's interesting that he, he closes that. He, he talks about if you want to, if you want to have truth, he, they, they were wondering about how he had such knowledge and how he knew the scriptures because he did not have all the formal training of the religious leaders of the day. And he, he says, it's because I'm doing God's will. And as I do God's will, I experience God's truth. And you can experience the same thing. And then he says, and, and why do you want to kill me for this? Now look at their response. They say, you have a demon. Who wants to kill you? Now, we look at this and we, we look at it from a negative sense, thinking of a demon as one of the fallen angels and, and, and one of Satan's uh, uh, minions to do his will. Another way of saying this is you must be crazy to think anyone wants to kill you. You see, these were the Jews on the periphery right here. Who, who, who is this guy? I've heard about him. The, they weren't the ones that were trying to kill Jesus. That was the religious leaders of the day. And Jesus turns around and he says, look. He says, I did one work and you're all amazed. Now the work he's talking about is back over in chapter 5 when we talked about Jesus healing the paralytic man that was, that was laying beside the pool 38 years, I think it was, for 38 years. And uh, uh, the, the, the scripture says the angel would come and stir the water and the one got into the pool was healed and this man said, no one is here to help me and someone else gets in first. And Jesus just asked the man a question, do you want to get well? And he responds, I, I don't have anybody put me in the pool. And Jesus heals him by simply these two words, get up. Get up. Now at other times, Jesus, when he healed a man that was blind, he took some, 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 some dirt and he, 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 he made mud out of it and he put it on the man's eyes and the man began to, to see again. That might be considered some work toward healing, but Jesus simply spoke healing it. He says, get up, pick up your mat and take off. And Jesus said, look, people want to kill me because I did one thing. I did one work. And people were all amazed. But then he comes back and he says, uh, but I want you to think about something. He says, consider this. Moses has given you circumcision. Not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so if the law of Moses won't be broken, are you angry at me because you made a man entirely well on the Sabbath? What Jesus is talking about, and every Jew knew this, is circumcision took place on the eighth day, the eighth day of life. And it did not matter what day it fell on, circumcision took place. And so if a child was born such that the eighth day was the Sabbath day, they still circumcised on the Sabbath day. And Jesus just pointing this out to him. He says, you, the, the Jewish leaders, are condemning me, are blaming me, are talking about me for breaking the law because I healed a man on the Sabbath. In reality, he didn't break the law. Jesus just spoke words. But they've stretched the truth. They, they made it look like something that really wasn't true. 
And yet at the same time, you circumcise on the Sabbath, and yet you're blaming me for doing something on the Sabbath. This doesn't, this doesn't fit together right there. Then Jesus, in verse number 24, gives this instruction. He says, stop judging according to outward appearances. Stop judging based upon what you heard someone say. Stop judging upon what you think might have happened. Stop judging upon what, you th you, you, what, what seemingly is true. Rather judge, according to righteous judgment, rather judge according to reality. What really happened? Verse number 24 is actually just the opposite of verse number 17 we spoke of earlier. The, the, the scripture says, if you do God's will, Jesus says, if you, if you are involved in doing God's will, then you will know the truth. It, you will see this is God's word right here. 17 is just the opposite. He says, you're judging based upon what you think happens. You're, you're, you're not involved in it. You don't know. You've just heard about it. You're judging. But instead, make your judgments based upon reality. I want to close this morning uh, with giving you five different positions toward, actually six different positions toward, toward Christ that we have seen throughout the book of Luke so far, or excuse me, th throughout John so far and will continue to see throughout the scripture as well. There are people that are antagonistic toward Christ. The religious leaders of the day were antagonistic toward Christ. They wanted to kill him. They had nothing good to say about him. They could not see reality because of their preconceived ideas. There were people that were just apathetic toward Christ. There were people that they weren't anti-Jesus. They weren't pro-Jesus. They were just, I don't care. There are people that were admirers of Christ. We see this. There are people that, that came and that would listen to him. We saw 5,000 being fed at one place, uh, plus uh, at one place. That they, they were admirers of Jesus. Then there are those that became believers of Christ. And some of those believers then became followers of Christ. They followed him. They listened to him. They obeyed him, but there are some that became disciples of Christ. So you, you, you think about it, this is not necessarily linear because a person doesn't necessarily fall through all of these steps, but every person is going to fall in one of these categories, either antagonistic, apathetic, admirer, believer, follower, disciple. It is the disciples that were the ones that were obedient to God. It was the disciples that truly understood His words were divine. His words were of God and from God. His words were truth. A disciple is one that is being transformed into Christ-likeness so he or she thinks and acts like Christ. Jesus did not come to the Feast of Tabernacles to build a crowd and a following. Jesus came to speak truth to make disciples. May we follow Christ through our obedience, discovering the truth of God's Word and being a disciple that thinks and acts like Jesus. Our Father, we thank you for our word today that you have given us from your word. Lord, may we be obedient to what you have for us this week. May we live within your will, and in doing so, Father, we witness, we can testify the truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Have a most blessed week.